does happen in conferences. I think mean, actually oh, yeah. panels with the panel of members in the audience. And those are usually smaller um, So anyway, Catherine, I'll turn it over to you. Well, we, of course, want to begin by saying what a wonderful conference it's been. Thank you, Milbauer Professor, and thank you, David, for such marvelous assistance. But we are looking forward to our next 50 years, and we think that this wonderful get-together has given us so many ideas. But I ask everyone to really think about the first 50 years of the SAW age, to reflect on some of the things we've discussed today. And I've asked each person to prepare a very brief uh, summary of their reflections. And then we're going to go to a few questions about strategically where we go forward. So I hope you'll begin by stating your name and your affiliation for the record, and then take off in any way you want. But this is really the gathering of the SAWH panelists, the former presidents, the former secretaries, and uh, SAWH members who are gathering in Gainesville uh, for the Milbauer Symposium, Strange Careers, Southern Women's History Over the Past 50 Years. So we're going to begin with Glenda Gilmore, who gave us such a wonderful talk this morning. And since I finished, I'm Glenda Gilmore, and since I finished with some admonitions about moving forward, I want to say one thing that I didn't really get a chance to say about transformations in the field of Southern history. And it starts with thinking about Gerda Lerner's uh, reflection on the fact that she wrote something about patriarchy is dying. And there was a lot of pushback because I think it was the late 80s, early 90s. And people said, but patriarchy isn't dying. We're fighting patriarchy all the time. Nonetheless, she was right. Patriarchy is a system whereby uh, men as well as women are required to act in a certain way, and that is to be patriarchal. It's designed as an elite kind of societal structure, gendered structure, to privilege a few men, not all men, but men who are in the position to act as patriarchs. I do think patriarchy is dying, and I think that um, that's really freeing for a lot of men. So I want to add to what I said, just to comment on male allies at the SAWH. <clears throat> um, we've, Bill Link obviously has been an outstanding ally to our work <clears throat> all the way through. And we've had many male members who have just put their shoulders to the wheel. But also, one thing I really appreciate is the male, men historians who have taken insights that were so hard wrought for our group and have applied them to their own work. I think of Bryant, <clears throat> excuse me, Bryant Simon's um, article, The Appeal of Cold Police in South Carolina, Race, Class, and Sex in the New South. <clears throat> He's looking at um, this politics of mill hands in a new way through insights that talked about how even seemingly uh, inconsequential actions among men are within themselves gendered. Or John Howard, who was a great um, early, uh, when I came to the organization, a great early participant who wrote Men Like That about gay men in the South. I think that work that's coming out now, like E. Patrick Johnson's Sweet Tea, Gay Black Men of the South, all of this came, well, it's not women's history, it came from us opening up how gendered the Southern landscape has, had been. And I think that's really important. At the same time, I'll just mention a um, couple of people who are doing the other sort of downstream thing from, from what we um, benefited from and wrought at the same time. Um, Stephanie's Masters of Small Worlds, T taking the idea of gender and applying it to Southern history as a whole. Uh, Kay Kaylee Merritt's Masterless Men, mm -hmm. thinking about how gender, how, how these sort of frames of Southern history and gender stood up in Appalachia. 
Bradley Proctor, if you don't know him, he's working about gender and, reconstruct, um, gender and reconstruction. And he's now in Oregon at Evergreen College. His book should be out soon. And Crystal Feimster, who's working on sexual violence in the Civil War. None of this work could have been done 30 years ago without the kinds of ideas that we sparked and the kinds of intersectionality that the work on Southern women and Southern women's work um, sort of uh, nurtured. And so I'm proud of that. And I'm proud of the men who decided that patriarchy wasn't good for them either. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks. Well, I think we're going to start with Melissa and move across. And then we'll, uh, Glenda, of course, was, uh, was, uh, not here for the first, and she therefore had to tailor her talk today to hearing four people before scooping her, so I thought I would give you the first word, thank so thank you. Melissa. Um, I don't really have a whole lot to add to all the things we have talked about, but I would say that I think that if for all of the wonderful work that has been done over the last 50 years, for all of the new stories that have been uncovered, um, as you said, Catherine, there are lots more sources out there and lots more methods for mining those sources mm -hmm. than we have even thought of yet. Mm -hmm. And so I think that, that the challenge for the next generation of historians is finding more of those stories, mm -hmm. those little known stories and finding new ways to mine those archives. Um, I just finished uh, editing a collection of short documentary selections uh, for the, the last of the books in the series that Carol Blesser founded at the University of South Carolina Press, uh, Southern Women's Diaries and Letters. And uh, uh, Beth English found a set of correspondence, or a set of letters written by a Virginia mill worker woman mm -hmm. in uh, the 19, <laughs> well, I think the 19 teens, 1920s. And there's a lot of that kind of stuff still in the archives. And, and in many cases, it's short, um, and it takes a lot of work to decode it, as, for example, with Laura Lowrich's Midwife's Tale. Uh, but there's so much rich material there, and it's up to us to figure out how to use it. Um, I also think that, that there are still big gaps in our understanding of uh, the role of Hispanics and Asian immigrants in the South, particularly in the 20th century. And that's a whole rich field of potential inquiry that we need to be getting at. So lots of opportunities out there for continuing to uncover the story of the South and the story of Southern women. Thank you. Betsy. I think that one of the goals that we need to set for the association is to concentrate more um, effort on highlighting, combating sexual harassment within the profession. Um, I know that it um, certainly must be a problem within departments, but I think it's a, a larger problem at conferences uh, where uh, men are away from their departments and <clears throat> I, I had the experience repeatedly of feeling that I was being preyed on. Um, and of course, early on, I was very flattered. Um, but, and I thought, um, boy, I've hit the jackpot here, <laughs> getting so much attention. I was very young and I, I was the woman that Glenda was talking about. And he didn't use the vernacular. But there was, you know, there was lots of um, flirting that went on, and and I don't know if that continues to be the case. I think men are more um, sensitized Some. To, to the problem. <laughs> but the the subtle kinds of harassment that go on, um, I think we need to find ways to combat. Thank you. Lisa, you want to state your name? I'm, I'm Lisa Tendridge Frank. Uh, I'm an independent scholar and I'm a PhD from Florida um, and a former mill power fellow. I'm really excited to be here and thank you for including me on your panel, Catherine. 
Um, so I, I mean, you want me to talk about how I feel about the SAWH or where I think it should go? Yeah. Both. Okay. Um, SAWH for me is just a very comfortable place to be. It's wonderful to be in an environment where you can tell your stories um, to other women and men who have some sort of either similar experience or at least understanding or sympathy with it. Um, I, I was raised as a grad student to always go to the SHA um, and I find that to be also a comfortable place but I remember going when it was all men and you see a couple of women in there um, and I sort of stuck close to the men I knew because I knew I would be protected because I did feel a little bit awkward um, and young and threatened and um, I still have experiences as a Civil War historian of men just not taking me seriously, male historians, um, because how could some woman know anything about war, battle, or soldiers? After all, she's just a girl, right? Um, and I keep waiting for that to go away. Um, but when I go to SAWH conferences, it's not there. You can have any kind of conversation you want. You can, I mean, um, Michelle mentioned the, the round tables that we've done there. Um, and they've been fabulous. Like not just that we had fun doing them, but the audience it gets really engaged and you have these wonderful conversations that you don't always get in other environments, not at the AHA. Um, you, you maybe have a couple people who are willing to listen to sort of trying to expand the scholarship of the Civil War into things that include gender and, and women and just like my focus is the interaction between soldiers and women is all the gender. It's not just like women's history specifically, but it's trying to look at everybody's attitudes about gender. But a lot of Civil War scholars would say that doesn't matter. You know, just look at look at the troop movements or, mm -hmm. or look at what the soldiers thought they were doing and that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. um, so SAWH for me is a place where that is something that gives me sort of the confidence to be able to do what I want to do. Um, and I think the important thing we were talking about sources both days, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I'll, oftentimes you just have to go to sources that aren't listed in any of those lists of women's history or gender history. I just go through as many things as I can and I know, I'm, at this point I know what I'm looking for, but you can skim a lot of letters and find any mention of women and people used to think, well, they talked about the women that didn't matter, nobody catalogs that. Mm -hmm. So it's not often listed in any of the finding aids or any of the details, but I can take what soldiers say about a woman and find like 50 soldiers saying similar things mm -hmm. and then women writing in their diaries about a similar um, action and then you know that this was important to everyone. This was something that people noticed. It didn't just get glossed over. Um, and so I just like that, I would like to see the SEWH just grow to include more people. Um, there, there is more inclusivity I think in panels on Native Americans and Latina and stuff, but not enough. I mean. I'm married to a Native American historian and he always, you know, each conference, oh look, there are two Native American panels, they're always at the same time. Mm -hmm. Or they've got their one Native American panel, you know. So I think there's a lot of, there are a lot of fields like that that just because the 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 people may be most people aren't doing those fields, they're not as well noticed. And so I think the um, the program committees are getting better at, at finding more people from different fields to get that included. Uh, but you know, it was a, a, now for me, it's easier to get onto a program because people recognize that what I do is something. But there are a lot of fields out there where people are still struggling mm -hmm. to do that. So if you don't mind me asking, the two of you both um, have been navigating as quote, this notion independent scholars. There's a lot of debate over whether you use that language or not. So I'm not really gonna get into that, but I want uh, maybe for you to comment on the SAWH in terms of being someone who is not an institution or department, and maybe you're escaping the daily harassments and petty issues of, <laughs> that you hear us <laughs> complain about when we come here, but maybe, you know, as a, I, I'm really asking about the role of independent scholars within the organization. Do you have any comment on that? Um, I just said to Melissa a few minutes ago that SAWH has been my uh, network and has been the way that I have stayed connected. And, you know, I learned a long time ago that if you go to the conferences and you wear your name badge and you visit with everybody. No one knows if you go back and teach classes somewhere. You know, the important thing is to publish, to, to be there and to participate and contribute and publish. And it really doesn't matter if you don't have a job. 
Although I would say SAWH is more accepting of that. I mean, mm -hmm. I get asked a lot, you know, oh wait, you're not, my husband's at FSU, you're not at FSU too, or you're not, why aren't you teaching? Um, and at SAWH, people sort of are okay with that more mm -hmm. than if you go to AHA, people are, they're not mm -hmm. gonna talk to you if it doesn't say University of Something on your name tag, right. unless they already know you, mm -hmm. um, at least in my experience. But I also <laughs> think once you've published, that becomes much easier. Right. Before I had, I had published essays, but before my book came out, people really didn't know whether they were gonna give me the time of day, and they usually didn't, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but not at SAWH, because everyone, there were so many different levels of people from different, you know, public historian. That, so mm -hmm. they're not, there's not that judgment factor, mm -hmm. I think, that you get at mm -hmm. some of the larger conferences. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, I agree with everything. You have to been. say your name for Oh, I'm so thing. sorry. Sharice Jones Branch, professor of history, Arkansas State University. And I agree with everything that's been said here. And, and while you were talking, Lisa, I was really thinking um, about name recognition and, and what it means in other organizations. And I distinctly remember going to conferences with an Arkansas State University badge and people taking one look at me and deciding I wasn't worth um, talking to. That's not an experience I've had with the SAWH. Um, and from the very beginning, I found it to be a, an incredibly supportive um, organization, and I often think about, I'm, I'm in a group along with Betsy Jacoway, the Delta Women Writers Group, and I believe we're all members of the SAWH. And so between that organization and the SAWH, I've been blessed to work with callers, co colleagues rather, who are incredibly um, supportive and, 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 and they give really important feedback about your work that is not intended to shred anyone's self-esteem, but to really help you grow as a scholar. And, and I think that's important, um, also along with the fact that I've grown and matured, and I've come to understand that that's what most of these folks want to do, is that they want to help you do um, your very, your very <laughs> good work. And it's also because of that that I've you know, met people like Melissa Walker, um, and I've read her work, and, and as I said yesterday, it's reading that kind of stuff that made me realize that yes, there are other areas that I can go into when talking about women, and particularly black women's uh, history, and it, it allowed me to do things that I never imagined possible. So I went from being a member of these two groups to discovering that there's a rural women's studies um, association, and that there's the agricultural history uh, society, and so I found that starting from this point, that there were other places where people would understand and respect my work. Mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't necessarily happening in other organizations. I mean, I talk about rural black women. I go to black history conferences. No one has a clue what I'm talking about, nor are they particularly interested. Mm -hmm. But I have found that not to be um, the case with many, um, with these two organizations and, and these women. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I, again, think we need to do more of is we need to make sure that we are a more inclusive um, organization. Um, I think part of my issue early on as a member of the organization uh, was that I was very intimidated and was just very young and very naive. And over time, I've worked through um, a lot of that. And because of the people I've met in this organization, I take it on as a personal responsibility to you know, guide those people through who might feel the same way I once felt. Uh, 20 some odd years ago. That's a hard thing to get over, particularly when you don't feel like you have anybody who's going to help you. You don't imagine. And sometimes you don't even think you have the right to ask uh, for the help that you need. Um, and so in, in my mind, it, this has just been a, a, a great thing for, for all of those reasons. And one of the things that I'm going to do as soon as I get home is I know a couple of young women scholars um, who are working on their doctorates, and for Christmas, they're getting memberships to this organization. Um, you know, because they're like, well, we don't have the money. Well, that's okay. I do. And I'm going to make this happen for you until you get to a place when you can do it. And then it's your job to pay it forward. But those are the kinds of lessons that I've just learned uh, as a member of, the, of this organization. Well, you mentioned writing, so I'd like to come back to it um, after we hear from everyone. But I know that there has been a component of the conferences, and Glenda was mentioning how important that was, where you would mentor, you would be sent a paper mm -hmm. ahead of time, mm -hmm. you had the personal responsibility, which you signed up right. for to volunteer to work with someone. And this goes on at our triennial conferences, but perhaps it's something that's so valuable and considering the timeline for graduate students, it might be something we could incorporate 
mm -hmm. into the SAWH if there's a way every year, um, you know, in, a, in addition to what we have, the, 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 the cooler and the bucket and, and, you know, and, you know, a way of like really uh, easing um, people in. Michelle. Well, um, I have Michelle Gillespie. Oh, Michelle Gillespie, Wake Forest University. Um, I have such great faith in this in this organization that I think the next 25, 50 years are going to be um, rather amazing. I have no worries at all about the exciting ground that uh, the scholarship is going to cover and the new ways we're going to continue to push and press um, women's and gender and sexuality histories, but also um, U.S. history and, and more broadly as well. I really appreciate um, what my colleagues have said about the importance of finding new voices, and, uh, and and really being more inclusive and having that represented mm -hmm. in our um, in our conferences and in the work that we do and I really agree with with Glenda in talking about the radical nature of this organization and how it creates a very different model for professionalism um, in in history and really in academics in general I don't think it's just history alone um, but even as I as I say these things I I want to um, I want to remind us that I think higher ed is not going to look anything like what higher ed looks like right now. I think 25 years from now, we are going to see um, a, a, some enormous changes in how academics works. And, and what, I don't know what it's going to look like for history. I don't look, know what it's going to look like for Southern history and Southern women's history. Um, I'm concerned about what's going to happen with state budgets. I'm concerned about um, the rising cost of tuition. I'm concerned about the kinds of consolidations of schools and then the kinds of consolidations of academic departments we're going to see, and I'm concerned about the number of faculty who are going to be contingent. And so I would ask the SAWH to think some, since we are, we are radical, mm -hmm. since we are activists, to really be thinking about what that means. How are we going to take care of contingent faculty as supportive as we are of independent scholars right. and of public, public historians? Um, what are we going to do for our contingent, uh, our, our, the contingent faculty, and what are we going to say um, to institutions as this happens more and more? And how do we support them when they're doing 4-4 teaching loads right. and just um, uh, what is that going to look like? So um, to that end, I had a couple other sort of pragmatic ideas that I would want to share with you all. Um, one thing I noticed that a lot of other associations do is that they, they give out teaching awards. We've always focused on scholarship, and that's one, and I think that's wonderful mm -hmm. and important. But when we look at the work that we do, can we think about um, offering an award in teaching that shows the innovative, imaginative, effective ways colleagues are incorporating gender, sexuality, and women's studies, not only in women's history or gender, but in, in all their courses. And so could we kind of showcase how you can do that through a teaching, a teaching award and also on, honor those faculty who are at places who can't necessarily always get their, their, their scholarship done at the same rates as, right. as, as other folks. Um, I, and uh, another thing I've been thinking about, we know because of the work we do, because we're Southern historians, that the local is global. So can we be thinking about the ways the SAWH can help make even more uh, connect connections between the work, the scholarship that we do, and our teaching, and um, what's happening at the local level? So how can we promote um, the value of what we bring to the table with the communities that we work in around us and our ways we can support that more in terms of helping understand neighborhoods and community building and also listening to our neighbors in our communities tell right. us um, whose voices aren't at the table right. and what, uh, how, to, how to make that happen and can we lead and what tools do scholars need and can we help them find them. Um, I think a lot about the work that so many of you have done around the table that is based on oral history mm -hmm. and oral histories. I know, I know you have given after you finished your projects, you've given your oral histories to um, different schools. Could we have a SAWH oral history project where SAWH members have done their oral histories, mm -hmm. put them together in one place, perhaps at UNC with the Southern Oral History, but they're under the rubric of the SAWH? Um, could we think a little more inclusively, we're doing so well in professional development and the stages of professional development, but I think we could do even more on alternate careers and, and, and have that sort of front and center in the, in the things that we, um, that we are doing. And then um, 
the last thing I'll say, and 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 Glenda, I thought you you nailed it. Resources, right? I mean, if there's anything, being able to have the financial resources to have the independence to do do what we've done is really important. And I think if this organization is really smart, we're going to get savvier, even savvier about that. And I think we probably can be thinking much more about doing our own development work, our own advancement work. Um, I think we should be looking at talking to our colleagues about their estates and what, and, and, and what relationship they might want to have their, their, um, in, in giving their estates to us or pieces of their estates uh, to promote the, the, the radical, important, significant work that we're doing. Uh, and so I would really challenge us to think about how we can incorporate that, integrate that into the work of this organization. And that will give us even more latitude to do more of this good work. Great, thank you. And I'm gonna ask you um, a little more. Why don't you tell about your project with Ronalda and your students to give our audience here an idea about how you sent them out? Oh, you know, I'm just saying. Okay, sure, I sure. Mean, you're, you're giving us all ideas. I know people are interested, so give a practical example. We'll give you a little more time. Of connecting teaching and so yeah. an, an example of my connecting my teaching and scholarship um, was um, as I was working on a book project on Catherine and R.J. Reynolds in the uh, early 20th century in, in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and kind of their contributions to the cultural and political economy, and also and, and their decision making and their their leadership and the challenges with it, um, I was able to invite my students to do a, a lot of work with me. So we did a lot of demographic work. We did a lot of neighborhood work. We went to um, we went to assisted living communities and did oral histories, and um, and so I was really able in that sense. I was showcasing. We were reading big picture pieces and then the students were actually doing the sort of research with me and connecting it up to what we were reading and also I was sharing with them my chapters as I was developing them and showing them how the work that they were um, doing was contributing to my work as well and the very act of, of figuring out how to align my teaching and my scholarship meant that I wasn't finding teaching exhausting I don't, <laughs> right and everything everything fit together um, beautifully and I have a lot more energy for all of it um, and I think my students found excitement um, in my passion for what I was doing and they right. found ownership in their work in the sources because they were writing their own papers out of it even as I was using it so I think there are really exciting ways with certain kinds of resources to to integrate your teaching and your scholarship that benefits everybody and I'd like to think the book also benefited the community that I'm in, in, as, in as well Great, and I'm gonna point to you, Pippa, and I'll great. come back. My head's too overflowing right now with all the great ideas. <laughs> all of our heads are overflowing. I think uh, <laughs> since, I, since I didn't have the pressure to actually give a talk this weekend of, or this week, I've had the great opportunity to take a lot of notes and think a lot. And I, I want to take this as a brief opportunity to sort of connect some of the. Literally, I just connected some of the notes that I took and questions that I'd written in the margins over the past couple of days, and really they started with uh, Michelle's talk. When one of I thought the, the provocative things that she mentioned was um, in talking about how histories of women, gender, and sexuality have reshaped the Civil War, also though how they haven't, and how that public discourse about the Civil War to some extent hasn't incorporated the amazing scholarship done um, in women's history. And what I wrote in my margin, wrote in the margin at that point was that we live in a historical moment where um, that's authorizing um, a particular set of power relations about whiteness and gender, right? This is the white male moment in a sense trying to resurge um, and also a moment in which there is a um, overt rejection of facts and truths um, <laughs> by that particular um, set of people who are trying to run our country again. And uh, it made me think a lot more about this larger question that we've been asking about how the history we write um, is also connected to and part of the present and how we're, we're always writing history for the present. Um, and just as they too are trying to, you know, <laughs> to whatever extent I can, we can sort of consolidate the, the Trumpies of the world into a them, um, that they too are trying to write histories for the present that they're also trying to produce. Um, and that got me thinking then um, when Glenda, I thought one of the really pro many, many provocative things you put up was that chart about um, there, how there's a decline in uh, women's participation um, in the SHA during the Cold War. I think you called it the Cold War chills. Um, and that was really striking because, you know, to think about again how the present um, is shaping literally the kinds of histories you write, the kinds of historians who are writing them. Mm -hmm. um, 
which then got me thinking about how, again, what we're doing, um, in, in, in light of what many of y'all spoke about, um, what we've done throughout this period as women's historians is to sort of aggressively and um, intentionally um, write the kinds of histories that we think matter and that will shape the presence that we're trying to create. Um, and to the extent that, um, for example, Catherine's discussion about how what we're collecting and archiving, that, that too is part of this. The people that are doing the collecting and archiving and building the archives are, again, part of this larger project. Um, Michelle, actually, um, there was a line I couldn't find. In, I'm sorry, Michelle, Melissa, um, there was a line in your talk um, which really resonated with me about, that made me think about how what is being written is important, but also what is being read is important, and that reading each other's work is also part of that act. It's about who we authorize, who we assign, whose work we talk about at a right. conference. Have you read this great book by X, Y, or Z? That's also part of what we do is um, the kind of promotion of each other's work. And that what really struck me in Charisse's talk, because what you did was something really bold. You put people's books up there <laughs> and you said, you know, these are the books. These are the books that are being written that mattered um, and that matter to our scholarship. And I it struck me as you were doing that that too was a kind of a political act mm. um, by doing that, a, a very savvy one, in fact. Um, all of that got me thinking back to the idea that what the SAWH is about, what the scholarship is about, is to say, you know, we aren't and mustn't be victims of the historical moment, but we should be agents of it. And right. that a lot of what work that people here have been doing um, is pretty intentional about that. Two more sort of related notes as I close. One is one of my pet peeves, and I won't, I'm not, one of my pet peeves is the <laughs> idea of using evolution as a term to describe what happens in history because it suggests a real passiveness um, and also a progressiveness, right? That things will keep getting better. Cold War chills are an example of the fact that they don't necessarily. Uh, the other one is just to get it off my chest. I don't like that bending towards justice thing because again, it's like, I get, I get the point, but like history doesn't bend towards justice. You got to sort of put your shoulder into it and shove it. You know, we bend it towards justice is the way I would think of it. Um, which then got me back to the last thing I'll say, which is um, a better environmental metaphor, one that worked a little better for me, was Glenda's comment in which she described a tsunami of Southern women's history. <laughs> so I, I think I'd like to move from evolution to tsunami as the uh, environmental metaphors I would uh, choose to um, appropriate for the kind of scholarship that we do and continue to do. I, 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 I like tsunami, but I also more approve of wave. <laughs> yes. oh, Nancy Take McLean. it down sometimes. No, no but Nancy, Nancy McLean was talking about waves and radar and spreading words and doing the metaphor of second wave feminism, third wave. So, I mean, because tsunami to some people you know, yeah. is disaster, and I don't think we want to talk about the disaster of work that is descending. But I think you're right if you're, you know, many of my Civil War colleagues are for rubble. And, uh, and reminding people what was there before, what it will come after. So maybe that's a good metaphor. We have to find different ones. But Connie, you want to okay, share I'm with us? Connie Schultz, and I'm a professor emerita at the University of South Carolina. But I'm also um, the senior editor and the project director of the Born Digital Scholarly Editions of the papers of Eliza Lucas Pinckney and her daughter Harriet Pinckney Henri. And then after we did the women, I'm now editing the papers of the revolutionary era Pinckney statesman. And I give those as my credentials because that's related to what I want to say. Um, Michelle said, we don't know what the academic environment is going to be in 25 years. We really don't know what the publishing environment is going to be. How are your books going to be published? Where are your articles going to appear? And I would like to make a push for the importance and that the SAWH becomes involved in helping to usher in and legitimize the use of these digital technologies in publishing in the future, just as it legitimized the field of Southern women's history and the field of Southern black women's history by showcasing it, reviewing it, mm -hmm. highlighting it. Um, it. My editions have never been reviewed in the Journal of Southern History. Mm 
Even though we invite them to review them, there's never been a positive response. Um, my colleague, Holly Schulman, who is editing the papers of Dolly Madison, a, a digital edition, a born digital edition, has been trying for 15 years to put together a collaborative um, sort of, she calls federal editing, where um, there are hundreds of examples of papers of women, which increasingly as um, the public cannot read cursive handwriting, mm -hmm. and needs to have editions of some of those papers in order for the students in university classrooms to be able to read those papers. Um, the, Holly's idea was that we would do a, a sort of collaborative edition of the papers of founding women, uh, of people of the founding era who were women who wrote, who exchanged uh, letters, um, where are their papers? If small individual women editors would do the papers of one woman and we did them all on the same platform and that we created a system where you, just as the University of Virginia Press has their collection of the papers of the founding era, founding fathers, if we had founding women together on a similar digital platform, we could look across all of their experiences in childbirth, in nursing mm -hmm. sick um, soldiers, in participating in politics, in all of the things that women did. Um, she has yet to get either the NEH or the NHPRC to agree that that's a good idea. Uh, we, she and I have been working on that for at least 15 years. So my plea is that we think not only about the topics, but the means by which we promote and publish our scholarship and that we provide a place where it is safe to say, okay, I'm going to do a series of blog posts on agricultural women, uh, black women workers. Uh, sometimes there isn't enough. Sometimes you lead up to a book uh, maybe a digital book mm -hmm. um, by a series of smaller efforts. Uh, maybe it will be tweeting, <laughs> <laughs> but maybe not. I mean, maybe a larger form. That, but that the SAWH can have a role mm -hmm. in moving into the future in the way that historians disseminate their work, make it available. Uh, make the voices of the past available. I'm specifically interested in editing in editions. Um, and then I'd like to say about the symposium, just very briefly, um, my role in the SAWH has been not as a scholar presenting papers particularly, but you know, being on the committees and doing the nitty gritty and, we, and um, conducting the oral history interviews and, and and when, when you're down in the weeds doing the work, you often don't see how important it is overall to a lot of people. And this symposium, to me, has sort of said, gee, we really did do something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was important. It is important. Mm -hmm. um, and I would end with that thought. And if I could pick up on that, that brings to mind another possible area of SAWH activity, which is advocacy. Yes. Um, so much of the time that I think as a profession we leave our advocacy to the folks at the OEH. Um, but something like this, this idea of a digital repository of women's uh, documents is something that if you and Holly were making a big push with the NEH and the NH. PRC. PRC. <laughs> Uh, you know, you could call on the SAWH to issue, you know, some kind of a statement of support and ask lots of us to uh, sign it. But there might be other areas of advocacy, for example, advocacy on behalf of adjunct student unions and graduate student unions that our organization might consider undertaking. And, and I didn't say it, but I will now, that the, for the profession to take seriously the role of scholarly editors as scholars yes. making important contributions um, and encouraging 
young women scholars to do, <laughs> or young men scholars to do scholarly editions of the writings of people whose work, whose thoughts won't otherwise be accessible or available. Great, so we have come up with a great number of ideas. I want to just add a few thoughts to that before opening it up to our audience for any questions they might have. But um, I would just like to say that uh, I find it so useful to go to the SAWH and hear people talk about their teaching. This is something Michelle said, so that, um, and women's history I think has been particularly good at advocating for the engagement of students in undergraduate research. And I've gotten so many ideas and through a network of women, meeting with one of our SAWH stalwarts, uh, Janessa Warnowski, who's working on the Texas Women Online. Mm -hmm. It occurred to me that when I first was teaching and I had students go to the, um, oh, now I'm gonna, it's gonna go out of my head, the Schlesinger Project of Notable American Women. Mm -hmm. They went to the Notable American Women reject file because that was a great resource of women who didn't make it into the first volume and I would have them do research on it as an exercise and they would all come back saying how hard it was. And I remember doing reference work and I, I can't remember who referred to the significance and importance of that early in the career, but I think it's so important. So here I was and I said, oh great, and I had out a group of suffrage names, Texas women suffragists, who will go both into Kitty Sklar's project uh, online at, at Alexander Street and the Texas State History Online. So you can have undergraduates as well as yeah. graduate students yeah. doing history, and I think that will bring them into the history major in a way, and is teaching, of course, a great skill. Um, I have the privilege of being in a department that is supported by a benefactor, John Now, who's one of the largest collectors of Civil War artifacts and documents, and in his private collection, I have my undergraduates um, read selections of the letters. They get very excited about it, and also the transcriptions are something that are useful and helpful. I can say it with even greater excitement that Michelle Crowell, who is the librarian um, sex specialist at the Library of Congress, has a project on Civil War documents. The students can go online and transcribe them. And this is something that they're encouraging scholars to have their undergraduates do. And I know it's worked at, um, but through a colleague of mine next door at Trinity University in San Antonio, and I'll be trying it um, next semester. But it, it sort of combines my two loves of telling students that I very proudly contributed to the, lar you know, the largest number of articles for an online, <laughs> no, not an online, for the, uh, encyclopedia, because I think working on encyclopedias might have gone out of favor, but that's where we do incredible work as well. I don't think we've talked about being asked to be on American History Online and having to go through these categories and see the 127 diplomats in the 19th century included. Are any of them women? No. Do we have any of the great women activists of that century? No. So that's something that I always say, volunteerism should be made carefully, but don't dismiss the reference books. That's where we really make dramatic changes. And in that regard, it's also very hard, I know, to take on um, the extra work we do in volunteering. But can I add, um, as I wrote about in the in, in my presidential address of the SHA, the Southern Social Network, never turn down an opportunity to be on a prize committee. Mm -hmm. And think carefully about how you appoint these committees. I was very pleased that when I appointed all female committees for major prizes at the SHA, I thought it was a really great thing that it didn't particularly change because Glenda, you're talking about that change and I would say the change in prizes over the past few years has been that when we gave prizes and began that process in the 1980s, we felt a need to have a prize for the best book in Southern history written by a woman. There were many who objected to that, women as well as men, particularly vociferous. I was recently reading in our archives the correspondence of someone like Carl Degler, who felt very beleaguered by this. I think it would be a great thing if we considered in the future the way in which our um, organization could give um, the Willie Lee Rose Prize in a way that would truly honor her, but not single her out um, in, in, in the way that she was 
perhaps of her generation, such a leading scholar and suffered, um, as some might have said, a debility from being the only one, but now we have a collective and we might think about a way in which we could give a first book prize or some other way in which we could uh, change. Because looking at these prizes, and I speak um, having frequently been invited to be on juries, and I find that a great privilege. My first one was quite bruising. I also wrote about it in the Southern Social Network, being bullied and mansplained in a committee of three. Um, but at the same time, it taught me a lot. The network was I reached out, I found someone on the Pulitzer board encouraging me to make a dissenting opinion. And in that way, a book was recognized quite widely and did do um, well. And the author has gone on to become a great friend. I recently served on an all woman jury uh, for the Frederick Douglass Prize and um, the four books on the uh, short list were interestingly all women. Um, at some point I, I, I felt doubtful, could I make this decision to move ahead this way? I had of course other members of the jury, it was going to a board that was not all women, but it was so interesting and important to me that the books that were emerging were the books I couldn't have imagined mm -hmm. when I first started with the SAWH. Books about, um, uh, books about, um, about um, slavery and enslaved women that were defining the field, that were changing the field, and um, the uh, prize emerged being shared, not split, as some people might misname it, um, by um, Never Caught by Erica mm -hmm. um, Armstrong Dunbar and by uh, Taya Miles, uh, for Dawn of Detroit. Now, I did have to recuse myself from the latter scholar because she was a student of mine at Harvard. Um, and um, I take no credit for her, but I didn't want anyone to think that I was advocating for a former student. And that's the other thing, that you do have to recuse yourself if you serve on these juries. Um, but there are rules that can be worked out. But what I was particularly heartened by was these books have already won prizes in organizations that certainly uh, do not, uh, are, are not restricted to women or advocate for women. So we can see that it has arrived. And for me, um, talking about the way in which the organization, the, the various um, shortlists and prize members have been active in the organization in coming to meetings and in um, gathering information, gathering support from having an organization that advocates for Southern women's history. And therefore, um, I'm gonna just conclude by saying, I think all of us are giving one another pointers, but we'd love to hear from you in the audience what you're looking for for the next 50 years. We have a younger audience than perhaps the collective age of us up here. So if anyone out there would like to chime in, Lauren, can I ask you? Sure. Well, Let's identify yourself. Sure, I'm Lauren Coleman, and I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Florida. Um, and I was struck by the statistic, Glenda, that you gave about women scholars and how, what percentage of them write, finish their second book. And I, know, I mean, we know one of the answers because mid-career scholars, female scholars are doing a lot of service work. Um, in fact, here in our department for this service roles from chair, associate chair, graduate coordinator, associate graduate coordinator, both of women, in part because some of our male colleagues have said, well, I'm not good at administrative work. Well, either am I, you know, <laughs> but I'll learn on the job. Um, so, but on the flip side, you can do a lot of change when you're doing these roles. And as you guys have demonstrated on the executive committees, you, know, you can really make crucial changes for the future scholars. Um, and address these kind of systematic problems that you see. So how do you balance doing this work that makes the change with advancing your career in other ways that are you know, more publicly recognized um, in terms of scholarship? In the 80s, I, I, I had to give up my campaign. I said, just be incompetent like the men and it will work for you, Jess, but that didn't really work. I could see that that's kind of a, a joke, but I, I, I do agree that trying to, to, you know, to work within, you only are given a certain amount of power within each committee, as long as you as a 
as a, a woman junior faculty member, you know, are able to do everything you can that would improve your position, that position, uh, even if it's giving you a marginal amount, I think serving on committees are good. I know that recently a couple came into my department and uh, the woman was asked to serve on seven committees mm. and the man three committees. They have the same rank. Right. Right. <laughs> um, you know, so what happens? The, the woman comes to me, uh, we speak about it because I do think senior women need to pay a very active mm. situation. And it came out of a conversation, how are things going? Uh, what do you think? You do have to ask people because people often don't want to come to you first thing right. with their complaints. But I would say seeking out um, senior women in the department, if there are senior women, is a great strategy or seeking out those advocates that, that Glenda talked about. I'm sure you can tell us stories about the, you know, finding men in, in power positions who are advocates of bringing women into departments and advancing them. Maybe others so. have. You know, we have a thing in our toolkit, a tool in our toolkit about just say no that I worked on, uh, about how to say no and how your department may know, not know that the university's asked you to serve on a committee, et cetera. So that's worth looking at and saying no to the sixth, fifth, sixth, and seventh mm -hmm. committee is certainly worth. But I'll also say this, and this is a harder thing because you can't tell what's coming, but life has seasons. Right. And there are seasons when you want to be senior essay director. I, you know, that was the toughest job I ever did at Yale. I could have been president. It would be easier than being senior essay director. There's seasons when you are, you think that um, issues in the graduate program need fixing, so you're DGS. There's seasons when you can go out and be more active in the profession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And life is very long. So my rule of thumb was not to repeat those service things, which is not to say that I'm so egotistical that I thought, well, if I went in and fixed it and you can't keep it fixed, that's your problem. But actually I did. There's no use repeating things that didn't work the first time. Right. So try to make a difference. Try to build in a structure that's going to make your differences stick and last. And then if it looks like it's an intractable problem, just move on. Go do something else where you can be useful, um, rather than repeating failure of not being able to reform XXX about your department or university. And with a lot of my coaching clients, I, we work mm. on this issue, and, and we talk a lot about what Linda said about seasons. And there are also seasons in your personal life mm. where you may have young children, you may be giving care to elderly relatives, and you have to take that into consideration as well. But I think it's also a matter of your own priorities. And for some people, that internal service is more satisfying than maybe producing another scholarly book, or at least at this stage in their career, as Glenda says. So you have to evaluate your own priorities. Um, but the other thing is you have to speak up, as Catherine said, and you have to go to someone senior and say, I need some help because I've been asked to do this and this and this but I'm already doing these three other things mm -hmm. and I can't do them all well. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, I need some help figuring out what should be the priority for the department and for the institution. Mm -hmm. And you throw the onus back on somebody else to help you navigate that mm -hmm. uh, service burden. Mm -hmm. Because I think Glenda's right, a lot of times departments don't know what else you're doing in the university right. that is uh, a source of <laughs> stress and tension and overwork. And there may be a way to get at this that not only helps yourself, but helps the institution as a whole. So at our at, at, at my school, we have created a, a survey instrument for every faculty member that, and where you list what department committees you're on, what college committees you're on, what university committees you're on. And so we can document it by department and we can give this to chairs and we can say, oh my, why is it that seven 75% of the mm -hmm. uh, associate, women's associate professors are doing 75% of the work. So it documents it and it takes it away from you, the individual, to show these larger patterns and it helps to create institutional change that way for everybody. But I also think there's a great strain there because you do read 
documents for promotion and documents for tenure. Uh, promotion to tenure and promotion to full professor, which always includes service. Mm -hmm. And I get quite angry at that because I have sat on committees where I've seen it disregarded. And I've seen uh, people advise people, um, unless you're on a very high national committee, there is you know, no <laughs> substitute for working within the university and having ticks, uh, boxes ticked. But in no way does that ever um, you know, preclude having a kind of stellar teaching, but more significantly, and this is the problem, they're given equal weight in black and white, but in reality, research is the one thing on which, in particularly historians, are, um, are really judged by, and it's not true in writing. So if you don't talk to people and don't consult, you, you often are getting bad advice, because it's department chairs business to fill those committees right. and to do it fairly and equally, to be a diversity person, to be a, an, uh, the untenured person on search committees is often, you know, a strategy that I think is just frightening uh, for people. Um, but do um, keep in mind that consulting with, with you know, a strong senior person in the department <laughs> who's navigated what you navigated mm -hmm. is often, I think, one of the best ways. And I think it's important as a senior scholar there was a moment when I woke up and I realized I was a senior scholar. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was fresh out of graduate school. Um, but I, I think it's important for our senior scholars to reach out to younger scholars um, as, as well. Uh, one of the things that I know is at Arkansas State in the past few years that a number of young American scholars just left the university. And by the time I found out it was going, what was going on, they had already resigned and they were on their way out. So now I make it a practice. You know, I don't nag. I don't want to be intrusive. I'm not trying to get in your business. But, I mean, just an email saying, hey, you ran across my mind. How are you doing? Let's have lunch or something like that. And I really do mean for it to just be lunch. And then two and a half hours later, you're going through this, you're going through that. How do I navigate this, that, and the next thing? And sometimes it's just enough for, to just listen and to let them work through what's going on. But there have been moments where I've had to say, well, you can't respond to this in a certain way at this point in your career, but I can. Mm -hmm. um, and so let me talk to this person. We go way back, you know, we've been together, blah, 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 whatever. Um, and sometimes things can be resolved in that way um, as well. But I think, I think the onus is on me personally um, to just be mindful of newer and younger uh, colleagues and what they might be going through. And I, and I think you make a choice about that because I didn't really have that when I first went to Arkansas State, but I made damn sure the folk coming after me had it. I do maybe want to go back to something we talked about yesterday and was touched upon by Connie, and that is the publishing field in Southern women's history. We talk quite glowingly about our series at Missouri, which is a wonderful series, but again has now been closed. We talked wonderfully about this incredible series um, at Georgia that Nancy Grayson really uh, spearheaded and shaped and has been finished by the wonderful Lisa Bayer. But we are in a real publishing uh, crisis that we as an organization um, cannot command our own series, I believe, easily at a university press. The university presses are being defunded. Mm -hmm. They're being uh, made accountable. They are um, in crisis. So can we give some um, insight to people on uh, publishing in Southern women's history and what we see besides the documentary platforms that Connie is proposing. Does anyone have any other strategies or ideas that they would like to, to share? I know, Lisa, you've recently done a reference book, and so maybe you can... Reference yes, books yes. I yes. Into it. Yeah. <laughs> You're not going to recommend a reference, no. Well, I think they're valuable, but they, take, they suck up a lot of time. Right. Um, I was doing that because... I, I wasn't teaching, so mm -hmm. I had the time to do it. But and so I think. Were you building up a core of people, though? I mean, does it? I had some people repeat, but there were encyclopedias. So you have like 150 to 200 um, authors to yeah. herd, like cats, mm -hmm. um, and they're all. It's all great at the beginning, but the ends of those projects <laughs> are really kind of a nightmare. And I, I've told many people up here. I mean, by the end of all three of these encyclopedias, my husband and I became experts on all sorts of things. Oh. One of my encyclopedias is like women from colonial times to the present. I don't 
no, you know, Iraq war female veterans, but I learned about them. Um, so they are valuable projects. I think contributing to them is um, a good way to build up a CV for younger scholars, although much to my chagrin, they really don't pay generally, unless you write a whole lot of them. Um, and I fought with the press, but these are always for profit presses doing them, mm -hmm. and they don't pay me really anything, and they don't give me any money to pay contributors. Um, so you have to decide how much it's worth to have that line on your CV. And one encyclopedia entry might pay you nothing, but it gives you a, li a line on your CV. Mm -hmm. And so, and it <coughs> won't take you very long. If you write, you know, a 500 word entry, you could spend a day or two on it. Right. Um, it's not like a real time commitment. So I think those things are worthwhile, but I, you know, you have to, if, if anyone ever wants to edit an encyclopedia, contact me, I'll tell you the highs and the lows. <laughs> okay. um, and I think actually UGA Press stopped that series, Catherine, because Andrew and I were slated to do the Florida version and they told us to cut it, mm. that they weren't selling enough, um, unfortunately. So sales, um, you know, is a real, uh, burden for publications, and it is showing up at university presses. Mm -hmm. What about participation in university presses? I've never had that, you know, since I spent 15 years of my career away from universities. I didn't build it up, and although I've edited many collections, and I thought people knew me as an editor, I've never been invited to be on the board of the Journal of Southern history, so there you are. I'm just asking my colleagues who have been on these boards, maybe they can, you know, um, say, you know, like Wake has a press. Mm -hmm. It's an it's a Irish, <laughs> Irish literature press. There you it's go. Very, it's a very narrow. Uh, oh, that's really yeah, cool. I was gonna say, I was on the board of the, not of the Southern, but of the, uh, the public history, the public historian for two different terms. Mm -hmm. um, and being on those boards allows you to encourage certain kinds of yes. participation. Right. Um, I, it's like being on a program committee, that you're able to spot things that come in, uh, not only to see things that people are volunteering, but that you can encourage people to fill in gaps of, of topics or ideas that aren't there. So, um, so yes, being, being on a board of, of an editor. But I think that as things move toward digital, mm -hmm. and I think increasingly the journals are going to be right. born digital, not just digitized by JSTOR, mm -hmm. um, yeah. that we need to be, as, as an organization and as a field, um, active in two ways, um, advocates in two ways. Uh, one is to encourage the creation of digital platforms where as the more traditional ones disappear and young scholars don't have a place to publish their work or to make their work available to a public, which is what publish means. Um, but secondly, to make that kind of, of scholarly performance legitimized mm -hmm. within whatever areas, whether it's museum uh, reviews of, of or, or whether it's in, in promotion and tenure cases, I think those two are going to change. Right. But, but we have to legitimize those alternative ways right. of getting your scholarship out there. Right. Yeah. What, okay. I'll just jump in real quick, which is uh, you know, the other thing I, I, I I know all of us do a ton of article and manuscript reviews, and that's that talk about one of the like least th most thankless jobs of the profession. You're anonymous; no one knows you do it. Mm -hmm. um, you slave away at these articles, and like I'm trying to help you make this better, <laughs> um, and they get mad at you. They're like, "Ah, oh, these comments are terrible." Um, but you know, as someone, I, I don't have a lot of graduate students, and um, for me, that's been a way, an opportunity for me to you know, surreptitiously and clandestinely quite often, you know, try to encourage um, and shape the work of younger scholars. Um, and also, you know, for the what gets published and what 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 is part of the, the canon of our profession. So um, we'll be back to your comment. It's a, a, a an important task that's a service test that is often not even acknowledged. I want to add one thing. Um, I'm a series editor for University of Pennsylvania Press, and many of you have been series editors and also for Penguin Press. And at UPenn Press, we have a great 
interim step where the series editor actually edits a manuscript uh, if you're asked. So I was asked to read Keish Blaine's book, Set the World on Fire, mm. and uh, before it went out to readers, which I did, and I did a full manuscript treatment, and sent it back to her, it went out to readers. And I think that really helps an author understand mm -hmm. where the author's work fits in the field because right. they've gotten a deep read. Mm -hmm. They haven't just gotten a three-page thing. They've got. mm -hmm. So if more presses could do that, that would be great. Or if you want to get involved in being a series editor who actually is a hands-on editor, that's great. But once I did that, the, other, the only thing that we all have to realize is you should blame promoted that book. Yes, she she got out there. Yes, she got she out did. there to start with. We've never had a book that has sold as much. Mm -hmm. And it absolutely deserves it. Mm -hmm. Everybody deserves mm -hmm. to see that. Mm -hmm. But she really digitally and by doing speaking tours and uh, every venue she could find mm -hmm. um, made her book a bestseller for a historian. Right. Mm -hmm. And I haven't done that with my past two books. Mm -hmm. I just haven't you know, you just get to the point and you're just mm -hmm. like, okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, presses have very little publicity right. uh, built in anymore. There's, uh, I heard from my uh, publicity agent for Define Dixie once, and she was eight months pregnant, and I never heard from her again. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think we all have learned to kind of depend on our own resources. Sometimes mm -hmm. they're slim, sometimes yeah. they're, mm -hmm. they're rich, but we also can learn from the young ones. So certainly mm -hmm. the University of Georgia Press has been pleased with the sales of Medical Bondage by yep. Deirdre mm -hmm. Cooper Owens. And if you follow her on Facebook, right. as I do, uh, mm -hmm. where, you know, where in the world is Deirdre? Right. And doing that is um, born, I think, of people recognizing um, how important it is for your book to be read and recognized mm -hmm. because we talk about fewer and fewer presses being able to go to conferences. The SAWH began in the 1980s to have book sales because not only was it a way of raising funds, but many people had books coming out and their presses would not come to the book um, to the book exhibit and therefore they would be willing to send and donate some copies to the book sale. I know it went away for a while, but it's coming back again. It, it does take a lot of volunteering. Glenda was remembering hauling books. People uh, did have that, you know, but I thought it was fun to push the luggage cart through the exhibit and get all those books. It wasn't fun afterwards when they didn't sell, but nevertheless, I, I, I think it's important. But I'm wondering, just in talking about this, you know, the importance of publishing and books and getting them out there. Um, perhaps the subvention issue comes up. Is that something that the SAWH could take on uh, as a fundraiser? Because we are looking at the fact we have a fundraising committee. We're looking forward to the next um, few decades. We're not going to do 50-year plans, five-year plans too short, 50-year too long. But <laughs> what about the idea that the funds that we're raising and the initiatives we're hoping will go forward? What do people think about a subvention? Any thoughts there? Is it effective? Is it ineffective? If, it's, if you give it a name and make it a, a prize, certainly, to help someone publish their first book, they have to have a contract. Right. The, but many times, I mean, I've dealt with... Recently, you know, no pictures on the part of presses, and some people are doing visual material. We know that the, the cost of permissions can take, I mean, it took me months and hundreds of dollars and also paying a research assistant to do it. Um, you know, it's, it's something I'm trying to say, you know, what can we do? Um, I know in the digital age, Connie, you can, you can put a lot of material up online. Mm, yeah. and you have to have all the same permissions. Yeah. Well, there's, there's some work I mean, around. A lot of people don't get those permissions. <laughs> okay, I want to say there, legally you must get there are workarounds. And the workaround is, for example, if you're doing a book and you have illustrations for articles that you're republishing, if you have a URL direct link to that article, if it's not behind a paywall, then you don't have to pay the permission for the illustrations. Mm -hmm. Take that one. Mm -hmm. If you're having a party at the Southern and you want to have a nice cake maybe and some coffee and spend less than $350, you can bring your own cake <laughs> if it has, <laughs> if it has, a picture on it because the hotel doesn't do picture cakes. Mm. But guess what? If you put your own book cover on a cake at a Publix, 
Piggly Wiggly, you have to have permission oh. <laughs> to have your book cover on there. So luckily I had to run back to the book exhibit, get write something. So think of the tricks that we learned <laughs> to get around <laughs> these permissions, because we are out there, but we're working in a very yeah. visual aid. And I would like you to repeat for the record what you were explaining to the graduate students about their their uh, web pages and you know at their own universities promoting their dissertations, promoting themselves. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that uh, I look at so many history department websites and the graduate students don't have their own photograph up or a good explanation of what they're working on where their peers do, but they just have like one of those little egg things. I really think that as much as we may dislike it, self-promotion is really going to be an important part. And you don't do it for yourself, you do it for your work. It's like you take care of your child, you get out there, and that's what Keisha Blaine did with that book. She got out and um, said, I think this is, these women were great and I want you to know about them too. And that's the way you should start as a young graduate student promoting yourself. And the SVWH has a Twitter account. Mm -hmm. And a Facebook page. Okay, with which I have not been trusted yet. But you we can should, always hashtag. Okay. We should all we should be promoting our members' books as you know, it's yeah. and we are. It's just everything takes so much time. Put it at the bottom of your email. Mm -hmm. That's yes. what I do. I mean, I put um, my most recent book, I put in progress. You know, every time I look at it, I know I need to get no, it. There are tricks to the trade. Yeah. Well, I know on that note, we all have places to go, things to do, things to get done. But I think we want to definitely thank the audience here today. We, yes. And see you next year at the SAWH meeting. We'll all be in Louisville to celebrate the Melbourne professor. Cheers. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Pat. <laughs>